Back then, the press referred to Glasgow as the murder capital of Europe, and a 2005 United Nations report named Scotland the most violent country in the developed world. The photographic project took me seven years to finish. I used it as an educational tool through youth groups and in schools, and as a result, met a small army of people working to change the culture of violence I had encountered. Ten years on, what I want to know is, has anything fundamentally changed for Glasgow and for Scotland? At the moment, the only information we've got is that we're going for a, a 25-year-old female. Uh, it's coming down as a, a dangerous hemorrhage. Uh, however, on the phone, the controllers had stated that maybe she's possibly been slashed. So, we're basically just going to need to wait and see when we get there as to what we've got. What time is it? It is currently 8.05. Breakfast time? Yeah. Before some of us have had breakfast. Someone's been slashed. Yes. Hey, you're okay, my side. Still okay. I'm halfway through six months of filming with the paramedics of Glasgow East Ambulance Station. I photographed much of the original project with these crews, and here, at the front line, is where I hope to find out if anything has changed in the past ten years. So, can you remember everything that happened? I have a little word, guys. OK. So you weren't knocked out or anything like that? Aww. Nothing. OK. I hope it's so bad. OK. Don't worry. Listen, the police are out there. They'll deal with whoever it is out there, all right? Don't you worry about that, OK? We'll get you sorted first, all right? And then we'll get you to the ambulance and get a proper look at you, OK? What are we going to do? We're going to... She's obviously going to need to go and get her stitched. So we'll, we'll take her out. Aye, we'll take her out and get a proper look at her. Get it cleaned up out there and we'll leave you to it. You put your hand up to stop this, I take it? Aye, no bother. <laughs> Get my fags out of the cupboard. Get your fags out of the cupboard. Well, we'll leave that just now, OK, and we'll get you sorted. All right, pal? Right, Mum will get you outside and get you seen to. There you go, pal. All the way around here. OK? I've not got anything, Crawford. Oh, you've got... Sorry. I'm going to leave the scarf for life. Listen, the plastic surgeons are great up there, OK? Three things. I'll get you outside, though. What we're going to do is let me see this for a wee second. Just take your time. No, no, no. Just keep your finger there. Was it big glasses of vodka? No, it was a just small ones. <laughs> just small ones. There's only, only been small glasses of vodka. I'm going to just give you a wee clean up a bit, okay? I'm going to clean your hands, you paper. Just. Let's have a look here. You going to sleep on me? Who done your eyelashes? <laughs> you? You're not very good at it, are you? <laughs> All right, no bother. So where were you last night? In my house. I hope it's too far to get them. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they I take will. It, I take it you know who done it? Aye. Did you tell the police that? Uh-huh. Well, they'll get them then. They won't, but... Um, they'll get an asbo. It was just... You've see got an asbo? Right. I have. You've been a naughty lassie? Mmm. Hey, Joe, are you OK? Right, I was going to head to the hospital now, OK? So how long you stayed up here? Two hours. You born and bred here? Eh? I said in Stirling's kind of way, two and a half years. Stirling? Aye. How was that? The jail. On the jail? <laughs> you can't exactly say I stayed in Stirling for a wee two and a half years and you were in the house. No, but I've been good now. 
Hey, you keep out there. Two and a half years in the jail. Don't oh, bother. We'll get that sorted. Um, How did you find that? Um, very, um, very therapeutic. Therapeutic? Uh, I've never heard of the jail described as therapeutic in my life before. I'm just going to pop a wee dressing on this just to stop it bleeding away, OK? There you go. So is that why you... Well, when did you get out of the jail? Eight years ago. And you've got an ASBO again? I think you're a light woman. I'm to get my socket. Right. You get it socket. I'm going to give you a blanket. I we need to get you on here first. Just turn yourself well. around. Have a wee seat in there. You look much better. Come here. There you go. I right, mind that, laugh so mind that we got. Watch out. Right, just put, put, put your bum straight on. There you go. Right, right so you yourself up. up. Get you covered up. OK, pal? Reason? Yeah, just take that. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Right. There we go. Try and look a bit sick, right? <laughs> Girls do get attacked, unfortunately. In the main, kind of statistically, it's young men who are victims of assaults. But no, it's can be anyone, any range, of age, anything at all. But it, it brings it home a wee bit more that she, she was only a young girl eh, and she's now marked for life. In three months of filming with the paramedics, this is the first truly violent incident I've attended. Ten years ago, incidents like this and much worse happened several times a week and sometimes several times a day. Unfortunately, Glasgow's always had a reputation for a culture of violence, and I think that here at the Royal Infirmary we've probably seen more of it due to the uh, deprived areas that uh, are within our catchment. Um, when I first started as a consultant and as a senior registrar, I was on a one in three rota at the weekends. And I can honestly say that every weekend I would be called in late at night because somebody had been stabbed through the chest and required to have their chest opened in the resuscitation room. I remember one night coming in, the nurse was telling me that the resus was a bit busy with some stabbings and I came in to find that the patient in the first cubicle was already undergoing uh, a thoracotomy, having their, their chest opened and the cardiothoracic team were in attendance. The patient in the next cubicle had a sword sticking out of his eye and the patient in the third cubicle, from all three from, were from separate incidents, had uh, suffered a horrific number of machete wounds all over his body and uh, unfortunately he died. In fact, all three of them died. I recall one where two brothers arrived simultaneously from the same gang fight. Typically they both had the injury which we very often see, which is a fairly small one to two centimetre length wound, usually on the left side of the chest. And they both had an identical wound in virtually identical places uh, on the left side of the chest. One of them had uh, a collapsed lung and the other one was dead. They were in separate rooms. I think the hardest bit was when the brother who was not dead was asking me how his brother was and all I could really say was he's next door. Um, eventually of course you have to you have to break it to them but very difficult. It's always difficult when it's young people. Um, one of the hardest bits of the job is telling any family member that another family member has died and it's difficult enough um, telling a young person that a parent or a grandparent has died but it's, it's really difficult telling a parent that a child has died. Um, it's 
just have to do it. So much of the violence I saw 10 years ago was a tragic waste of young life. In 2007, I photographed the location of one such incident. I had just finished night shift, actually. I just finished night shift at the Queen Mother's Hospital. My sister lives facing me, so she lives across the road. And she came running about 20 past 12, I think, um, and shouted that James had been stabbed. Um, so we drove frantically and got to the street that it was on and knew instinctively that that's where he was because of the crowd of people and lots of screaming and James lying in the street with somebody behind him holding a towel and two police hovering over him. And I think screaming at them, what, what's happening, what's happened to him? And at that point, somebody had said that he'd been stabbed. Uh, didn't know where, didn't know how many times. And I think I automatically must have went into nurse mode and was just thinking, oh my God, he's, he's injured. Um, and knew by his face, he was pale and his eyes were rolling slightly. I couldn't find a pulse at first, I remember that. I remember feeling his neck and thinking, oh, he's got to have a pulse because I can see his eyes. But I think it was just me. I was, my adrenaline was too high and I definitely, I look back at that now and I think, where was my instincts as a mother? Sh should I just have taken him in my arms and let him know I was there as his mum and I never? I totally went into nurse mode and if I could stabilise him in any way or anything that we could have done. So I'd, I know my brain switched to some automatic mode that somebody's injured and I need to help them. Five times he stabbed him. He uh, stabbed him in the clavicle, I think. I think a rib and he stabbed him in the back which went through his aorta, so he stabbed him in the big major aortic artery of the heart. And that's why he bled and bled, and that's what killed him. The, the last stabbing was the one that killed him. And that's why he collapsed where he, he fell. And then fortunately somebody came and got us and took us to the Royal. I just had this belief that they'll save him. And things started to get better and he started to become more stable and they were moving him and everybody left. And when everybody left, it's like a sigh of relief. If all these important people don't need to be there, he's fine. And I remember the picture of a lone nurse over him, taking off machines as I left. And within seconds of leaving, she came and they had a, went into cardiac arrest and somebody's over them doing CPR and other people start to come back again. And you still don't believe and you're watching them and the next minute everybody stops and his heart stops, his life stops and your life stops somewhere there as well. And he then becomes part of a crime scene and you're thrown into something that is the most unimaginable process you'll ever experience. And they quite easily take off all the drips and take off all the machines and you're left with James. But it's no James. Nothing's ever the same again, I suppose. Part of your heart stops when his stops.
The murder of Joyce's son James wasn't an uncommon event in the Glasgow of that time, and the level of serious violence I encountered only a decade ago was truly horrific. That violence is still out there, only now it seems it's happening much less frequently. Just before I finished filming with the Glasgow paramedics, we were called to a serious assault involving a bladed weapon. It was only the second incident of its type I had witnessed in six months. Uh, we're responding to... We're responding to a call just now uh, where it's reported that two males have been stabbed uh, at an address. It appears one of them uh, may not still be alive at this point in time. All we're being told is that the place is covered in blood and someone is either unconscious or in cardiac arrest. Right, on to the couch, come on. Come on, you're losing a lot of blood, so I'm going to count, eh? We never harmed each other in any way. Right, so what happened tonight then? His wife left some days. Four months ago. What's happened to your hand? I don't know, he attacked me with a knife. He attacked you with a knife. Where is the knife? I've no idea. Okay. Tell what the guy tells you. Do what the, the person tells you. Do as the paramedics are telling you. They've got a job to do, right? They've got difficulty to treat you and your pal. I don't even down. know if I've got pressure on where it is, John. There is it. Aye, oh, just uh, just that. Give her a yeah. jam, mate. Don't try to pinch up on Stum. me. Okay. okay. Biggest dress in the world. Might have the fun. I'm not surprised. It's a bit severed, you know. I can see your bone. Oh no. Everyone's absolutely covered. You're going to be fine. No, don't worry about that. You're going to be fine, right? You've lost, you've lost an awful lot of blood, Pet. You're just going to feel a sharp scratch Why in the back they, of your hand. Why did you do that? I don't know. I need you to sit nice and still for me. Nice and still. OK. Well done. You've done an awful lot to drink the night, eh? Yeah. But I don't know what happened to him. He just stopped getting a psychotic. Do you see this wee chair here? Oh, that, that, that's what you're going to need to sit on, pal. Right, okay. You keep your arm up and you manage to stand. Now watch, it's, all, it's, it's awful slippy, right? Munch oh. that forward. Right. Oh, 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 oh. I know these things happen when you're least expecting it. Okay. Oh. Oh, GRI, just advise you, we're bringing a standby in. It's a male in his 50s, uh, knife wounds to his right hand. He's lost quite an extensive amount of blood on the scene. He is conscious but intoxicated, still bleeding uh, at the moment. ETA, four minutes. Uh, he's GCS 15. Saturating at 99, pulse of 88, blood pressure 106, 91. Roger. Just swing. Push your toes. Awful high up, so keep, keep it. Oh, you watch what you're doing. have situations some nights in this job where 
four, five, six ambulances are all offloading one after the other. And each person, each patient that's being brought into the casualty department in some shape or form has arrived there due to the amount of alcohol they've consumed. Either they've injured themselves or they've become unwell or they've been involved in a violent incident, they've got into a fight, but in some shape or form, the root cause of it is the misuse of alcohol or the overuse of alcohol. it seemed the press weren't sensationalising the situation. In fact, many incidents went unreported. But fast forward 10 years and I've only encountered two serious knife assaults in six months of filming. It seems to me that the city has had enough and something is changing. I think as a city, we've moved on significantly. See, like Easter House, one of our local kind of housing schemes, there used to be, well, there still are, but gangs and areas up there that were defined by gangs. And now, I mean, I was born and bred in Easterhouse. I, I lived my life there. And when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of gang culture. But now you go up, you go back and you, you speak to some of these folk, or you go into one of the surgeries to speak and you mention the name of any gang and it's frowned upon. It's like, no, we don't talk about gangs here anymore. I mean, there's, you could name loads of different initiatives out there that are all chipping away. And collectively, they're, they're making a big difference. Since you were last in doing the photographic project, um, violence has reduced. Um, we, we've been counting it and we are, we are able to demonstrate an actual reduction in the number of violent attenders. I think the work of the Violence Reduction Unit has been key and um, I think uh, information sharing that, that we had been involved with earlier on allowed them to target specific areas where violence was occurring. Furthermore, I think the Medics Against Violence uh, initiative where doctors have been going into schools and speaking to uh, young school children and showing them the devastating effect on uh, individuals and families of violent activities. Added to that, I think the courts are taking a much tougher line with uh, knife carrying. And I can only assume that all these things combined and other community projects and the work of the youth groups working with young people has all uh, combined to have a, a positive effect and I can definitely say that we are seeing a difference. Back when violence in Glasgow was at its worst, a body was set up to devise a strategy for murder reduction in the city and it became known as the Violence Reduction Unit. The VRU has largely been responsible for a complete overhaul in the way violent crime is tackled in Glasgow today and violence prevention has become its key objective. John Carnican, a former murder detective, was involved in setting the unit up. Criminal justice is a service of last resort. By the time it comes to policing and prisons, it's all over. I mean, it's like the, I heard a great uh, expression the other day when someone said, building more prisons to deal with violence is like building more graveyards to deal with AIDS. It's absolutely stupid and it doesn't make sense. 
Changing attitudes to violence amongst young people is at the heart of what the VRU is doing, and amongst many schemes started by the unit is the Community Initiative to Reduce Violence, or SERVE. SERVE was founded in 2008, initially to target gang violence in the East End of Glasgow. We decided to speak to the gang members because we knew who they were. We decided to tell them to stop doing it because we'd had enough and they were having a bad effect in their communities. And we decided to offer them alternatives. And that was, that, that was the simple message we serve. Of course, the complication was we had to get all the partners around the table to coordinate the services they delivered. And, um, and that was a challenge. But we managed it with, with most of the partners. Um, and as a result, we, you know, gang fighting in the East End of Glasgow at the end of SERV was evaluated by the University of St Andrews and Peter Donnelly's team. It was down 53%, 53%. grant from Comic Relief, Fair took the unprecedented step of creating a position for someone to explicitly target the issue of gang violence. That someone was Jimmy Wilson. When the council built these houses in the 50s, they were fantastic houses, but there's more to building a community than just houses. About 80,000 people moved from the slums of Glasgow into Easter House with absolutely no amenities nothing that could bring them together as a community. There was no youth clubs, there was no churches, the police station wasn't built until the 70s, the Shamrock shopping centre wasn't built until the 70s, there was no employment, people had nothing to do, youths had nothing to do, they were got bored and therefore territorial divides were raised and they territorial divides have plagued not only Easter House but other areas of the west of Scotland and, and, and beyond for decades. It's the reason why Fair is here, because there was nothing to do and the local residents wanted something within their community to, to have and hold to be a community. However, by that time the, the, the gangs were already here uh, and, and generation after generation got involved in the gangs and unfortunately many, many, many young people lost their lives through knife crime and, and various other forms of violence. Fair engage with young people in a variety of different ways. In addition to school programmes, youth clubs and residentials, FAIR also work closely with housing and police to target specific areas and groups of troubled youths. My involvement with FAIR has been to run photographic workshops with groups of young people. Through photography, they are encouraged to articulate the positive and negative aspects of their lives. Guys, this. Why is the Bridge. Bridge. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that your nose? Very. Very scared. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's both. Gangs. Why not? Because uh, you get into trouble. What's this? That's cool, man. That's brilliant. Wicked. Okay. Wiki wiki! <laughs> Fun. I'd keep it in there for another week. <laughs> <laughs>
No, I don't fucking stay put. Go. Uh, hey, can I put it in there now? Is that about a minute? That's about three minutes or something. Is that what was doing spoke my life? Can I? Put, put, put it into the stock back then. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 10, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Like, that's it. Is that? I just sat in that, what if it burns me? Yeah, you should try and help try it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, look. Looks good. So what's the significance of the bridge then? What's the significance? What does it mean, I'll tell you? Bridge? Why do we fall down the bridge? Because it's a negative. Why is it negative? Because people fight on it. Some of the young people we've worked with over the years have come from nothing short of horrendous backgrounds. And one of the main issues that FAIR have as an organisation is that if a young person is involved in, a, in, in gang violence, then society only see the tip of, of that, i.e. they see that the actual violence which is going on that that young person is involved in. What society potentially don't see is the horrendous life and background that the young person's come from. My name is Dean Crawford, and I'm just going to tell you a bit about my life. Uh, when I was Obviously, just a baba, and I had a stable family. My mum and dad, my three big sisters, everything was fine. My, I had hers, my family was brilliant. When I turned three, it was my big cousin's communion, uh, and we all went to my auntie's house, Esther, for the big Esther party and things, and stuff just kicked off outside. My dad had went out to try and sort it, and things just went upside down, and my dad got murdered that night. Ever since then, things just, just like a bad cycle, kept going worse and worse and worse. So when I was starting school and things, I started to notice that my mum was drinking every day and it was getting worse. It was, as soon as she was waking up, there was a bottle of vodka beside her on the couch and things like that. And I started to realise this. And I started to realise that she wasn't stable enough to get up and check me for things. And, stop me for doing things, so I just thought I could be bad all the time and get away with it. One of the things that FAIR do do is that once we get to know a group and we get to see who maybe the leader is of that group, we try and recruit them. We, we were running a Friday night, Friday and Saturday night project called Up Phoenix, and I was running that one night and in Mock the Bulldean. And when he walked in, he had everybody walking behind him. So he was quite clearly one of the main dudes. I was in primary seven, and I was away in a residential for a week. Uh, and we went away on Monday, and on Wednesday, my mum had died. We obviously had alcohol and things, and I came back to my house, and everybody was in. And I thought they were all there to see me, but they weren't. They. It was just to tell me that obviously my mum was not here anymore. And I just thought the best thing to do was just hang out with my pals and cause fights with everybody else. And it was just constant children's panels, there's their children's panels, getting involved with the police, getting suspended for school, going to fourth year, just to form exams, and the teachers just going to honour it anyway, the way I was with them, and try to pick, things, try to pick fights with them and things. And they just did enough for me and they kept me out. Jerry found out that I'd been kicked out of school and phoned me up and asked me if I wanted an interview to come and work for fair. But he sat me down for it and he said to me, like, you've got to just think about all the things that you're doing and let them all go. He's like, you can't date anywhere, you're going to be a role model to 
obviously the younger kids that you're going to work with. And he's like, I'll be you half an hour to think about it. Go and take a walk and then come back to me and tell me if you want to continue on with My head was gone 90, just trying to figure out how is this going to be possible to stay out of trouble and things like that. But I went back and I said, aye, I'll take it. I uh, went in for the interview and I was successful on it. Uh, and I had got the job and that's just when my life started to get better. Look at Andrew. No, no, no. He was close to taking the wrong road. He's had a bit of a, a rough ride in his life and he's now using that rough ride to, to work with young people and help them in their lives. And, and a couple of months ago he won the Unsung Hero Award for the Sunday Mail for the whole of Scotland, which was fantastic for him. You know, he got dressed up in a kilt, had a really, really nice night. His three sisters came to the event, it was brilliant. No, it was massive. It's massive for the community. He's from Easter House. He's a local boy from Easter House. There's not many local boys from Easter House who can say they've won the Unsung Hero Award. In Drumchapel, on the other side of the city, is the Argo Boxing Club. It's run by Davy Savage and his mate Paul McCann. I've known Davy for over 30 years, when at the age of 10, I started boxing and he was just turning professional. He's been an Argo Club member, one way or another, for most of his adult life. They opened the club up when I was young, I was about 13, 14. And my first time in the club was to join the dancing, the Kansas City Rockers. And I was in the Kansas City Rockers for three weeks, but Jimmy Harvey opened a boxing club at the same time as well, so I joined the boxing because my dad was a boxer and I always liked the boxing, so I joined the boxing uh, and the dancing. So I either became the boxing or the dancing and I unfortunately stuck at the boxing. <laughs> uh, and that, that's been my life ever since. This is what's left of the old Argo Centre. In 2010, council funding was removed and the club was burnt to the ground shortly afterwards depriving the community of a much-needed immunity for its young people. That was from 1974 to 2010, it shut down. And within two weeks, it was set fire and built, and now it's lying empty. A bit of, a big bit of ground lying empty, for the youth, because they were youth clubs for kids, and now they've got nothing. A lack of money in the council behalf. A lack of trying in the council behalf. Davy didn't take the loss of the old Argo Centre lying down. New premises were leased, and eventually, a new Argo Boxing Club emerged from little more than a burnt-out shell. Home. This is the club, we, this is a, the building we got when we came in. So, as you see this, it looks pretty good. So, this is, when we came in, there was no ceiling. This is a new, new train there, we built new doors, new lighting, new everything. This was a, this was just a shell. So, we've taken over and we've done well with this so far, so. It was, it was just, it was just brick walls. It was no just brick walls, walls, aye. Just brick walls, no ceiling, uh, no lighting, no nothing. Uh, there was three inches of water in here because the vandals came in and ripped the copper pipes up for thingy, for scrap. So we managed to get the flood out and get that sorted. So this is this is it's coming on good now. It's looking the part. My early youth, staying in Kendon, tenants everywhere, uh, gangs everywhere. Uh, so the boxing gave me a, an escape to maybe get away from the gangs, but I did get involved with some young boys and we would do things with young boys done. 
from we were about 15, uh, we used to go and run out of Clay Bank and fight with boys with Clay Bank and boys with Clay Bank would fight with us. Because I think today, a, a Friday night, if I wasn't at the boxing, the boxing was on a Monday and a Thursday then. Uh, so it was about four different gangs in Dumchapel in the days. Uh, but a lot of the boys I knew involved with weapons and uh, some of them got stabbed, some of them got chipped. But that was one thing which I was never involved with. I didn't, I didn't like weapons. I always used my horns and fought with my horns. But as I got to about 16, I was getting more and more fights. I was getting a wee, wee chances of winning championships and that. So I was, uh, the boxing kept me away from a lot of the violence. Uh, it really done, done me good. Kids for the chapel, kids for Clay Bank, kids for Dalm Muir, kids for Bears Den, kids for Mary Hall. The most important thing is getting all these kids involved with each other and so they work pals everywhere. No enemies, no going into it. No as if they're feared to go for them chapel to Clay Bank to Mary Hall. They've got the confidence they're gone because they've no pay they know different people for different areas. Thursday night's Friday. Friday and Thursday. That's at the Albion Social Club in Yorker. Uh, they were having an amateur show. Uh, all these young boys are there, they were fighting on the show. So we're just getting them prepared for Thursday. Hopefully we'll have four winners. Or five winners we've got one. One of the boys isn't here yet, but we'll have five winners. Keep going. That's it. Keep going. An event on this scale means several months of organisation over and above the coaching commitments of the Argo team. No one is paid for what they do, and it's this hard work at a grassroots level, here and in other parts of the city, that is making a difference. Against all odds, the Argo club has not only been rebuilt virtually from scratch, but they've doubled the club's opening hours to five nights a week. More young people than ever now benefit from this essential service to the community. And it goes to the ring in the red corner, red and black shots with white trim, official weight 43.2 kilos. Boxing right here for the Argo, Amazon Boxing Club from Chapel Glasgow. He is Kieran Swin! important thing is for kids to get involved with sport and get away from it. Whether I get a boxer or a runner or a football player, but see if I can get a kid from the ages of 11 to 15, 16, they're away from that drug and alcohol system at that age. That's, that's, the, that's the bad age from their 15, 14, 15, 16, and they're starting to try things with their pals, alcohol, drink, smoking, drugs. If you can get them in a club in that age, get them involved in the sport, get them, get them training. Get my way a couple of weekends, then I know I was making a life and just drinking that, drinking drugs. There's hundreds of things to do in life. The plan for this morning is we're going to run a DVD to show really the bits that we see that possibly you don't see, the bits that, that people who've uh, carried out violence, who've had violence carried out on them,
who've had family members been affected by violence, who've been professionals trying to treat people affected by violence, to show what it looks like. Medics Against Violence, or MAV, is another group I've been involved with. It's a charity set up in 2008 and runs programmes that visit schools with the aim of educating young people on the impact of violence. I'm proud to have some of the original project photographs as part of the programme. Michael Murray is a consultant anaesthetist who has been involved with MAV from its outset. We introduce ourselves, we show a DVD, and the DVD contains uh, stories of people who've been involved in violence, you know, the receiving end, being the perpetrators, being professionals that have been dealing with violence, to show the impact it makes. The 14-year-old boy had taken a bottle of Buckfast from one of the other gang members from the opposite gang, and he took a drink of it. Therefore, that gang then pulled a screwdriver out on this young boy and stabbed him several times, uh, one of which went in the front of him and out the back. You know, he's screaming for his mum. He just kept saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And his clothes were soaked with blood. Uh, by that point, we contacted the ambulance and they came and it was just, by that point, it was too late. The wee boy had died, you know, right in front of my eyes. Part of the school talks are also to dispel myths that canning a knife keeps you safe. Uh, we've probably spoken to something like 13,000 children across the, the west of Scotland in particular so far, but we have covered larger areas as well. And really it seems to have had a significant impact. If you ever go out at night, does your mother ever say, are you going out, son, or uh, hen, uh, take a machete with you? Or take a handgun? You know, mums are usually the people that will try and keep you safe. But if you're carrying a weapon, what it does is it does the opposite. It makes you more light. Change, and that carrying a weapon changes your behaviour and they put you at risk. Like many of his colleagues involved with MAV, Michael's motivation for volunteering in the programme stems from his personal experiences, prepping victims of violent assault for surgery. There was one particular case, a boy had been standing at a bus stop, um, but another man had been in a fight earlier, decided to go with a baseball bat uh, and get revenge on who he thought perpetrated uh, the initial incident. You couldn't find him, so this boy, who was about 21, 22, standing at a bus stop, and uh, this guy struck him over the head with a baseball bat. Um, just one blow walked off and the chap was found. Um, he died a week, about four or five days later, and at some point you, you suddenly think, this is just insane, it achieves nothing and it's happening all the time. And you go into work on a daily basis and half your very expensive to run intensive care unit is full of assault victims and people who, frankly, are going to need to care for for the rest of your life at enormous cost to the taxpayer. And at that stage, in fact, a few weeks after that, Medics Against Violence almost happened to run their official launch here. And I thought, if we could change and prevent this from happening, this would be a much better uh, way to go. So when Medics Against Violence launched, I thought this seemed like the ideal opportunity to actually move in to try and stop some of these things happening. Well, that's, what, eight years since you were here. And in that eight years, there's a huge leap forward. That's not saying it won't go back or that we won't ever have wee spurts. We always will, but in the main, I think it's, it's going in the right direction. Medics Against Violence was, was thought up by a few, a few doctors that were, in other words, a bit fed up with patching folk up, young men, patching them up, sending them out, and then the same men are repre representing again a few months later with more slashing, stabbing wounds, anything like that. In the main, it's just all doctors. And us being paramedics, we were thinking, we are the ones in the forefront of this. We're the ones that are the first contact that these patients have. And we thought we had something we could give to this. And they accepted us, they, they put us through the training, and we've been going into schools. Hopefully, that does change people's perceptions. It's, it's no point talking to adults who walk about with knives, because you're not going to change all their minds. They're going to be walking about with knives. But if you get the youngsters and change their perceptions young enough, hopefully 
they'll grow up to the, be sensible young men that won't need to walk about with a knife. We only ever hear about the bad things in Glasgow, how violent it is, and it is violent, but it's getting better. And there is so many young, inspirational people in Scotland, and especially in Glasgow, young men and women that are making a difference to their lives and other people's lives. And it's trying to take that forward and just give them a chance. Just let young people have a chance, let them get an education, let them experience things that are there to be experienced and let them live and hopefully let their parents see them grow up and enjoy them until they're old and grey. <laughs> and that's just something I will never have the chance to do. It's a passion for me. It's a passion for most of the people who work for FAIR and it's a, it'll be a passion for most youth workers. It's not about the money, it's very poorly paid, in my opinion, for what we do. But it's, 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 a, it's a crucial part of society now that youth workers can have an influence on young people's lives and get them to the next stage in life. But it's not just about the youth worker, it's about that youth worker working in partnership with schools and education and police and housing and a whole host of other things. But the young person needs to be able to trust you. To get the benefit out of the relationship, the young person needs to be able to trust you. And, and young people do like rules in their life. They like boundaries. Because that's why they try and overset them. If there's no boundaries there, then the game's not as fun. I've had lots of bad days. Young people getting killed, stabbed, wounded. And we're impacting on people. Sometimes it falls on deaf ears, you know. And one of my worst days was when a young person I worked quite closely with got 17 years for murder. I found that quite sad that I had the, the, the possibility to influence that young person, and yet when they were 18 years old, they felt the need to to go and stab somebody. Quite horrendously, actually. And that's sad. Pretty sad. Uh, so they're not good days. We see young people getting on in life and doing really, really well for themselves. Magic. Kind of be You know, they come back to you years later. And thank you. Thanks very much. That's my way of looking at the negatives. And if I look at negatives, they're far more positives. So, although sad at the time, you need to get on, because if you don't get on, you can't help other young people in the future. And that's the way I see it. The night there's going to be a, a rave in the bridge. There's going to be over 400 young people from how many, many areas? From 16 different 16 areas. 16 different areas. Um, there's going to be six different, six to eight different acts performing. The GBX, experience. George Bowie, the main act, so that's attracting all the different young people. We're going to play James Kerr. Aye, James Kerr. Um, this is probably about the tenth, eight, tenth rave. Numbers have been quite good at the past, in the past, but this is the biggest rave we've had. So um, it'll be, it should be good. These raves that were gone to the night only started about two years ago. Um, when I was younger, it was the, the project raves, um, which were very small scale compared to these. You probably had about 30 wee dafties in a wee hall for the one scheme, sometimes two. Uh, but they were very small compared to what we can do now, because you couldn't obviously integrate so many rival areas. Um, about 10 years ago, so obviously all the work that's happened in the past years, we can now bring all these different areas together. I think there 
there's about 20 organisations all working together for the same goal to ensure that young people had a great time and that's what Partnership Walk's about and it's that's a community spirit that, that we have now in the North East about all these organisations coming together for the benefit of the young people or the communities that we serve. What's happening here tonight is amazing. 400 young people are here from 16 different areas of the city, all having a great time. Back when I started the Knife Crime Project, an event like this couldn't have happened without some kind of violence kicking off. There's no doubt that Glasgow still has its problems, especially when alcohol and weapons are combined. But since I finished the project, knife attacks in Glasgow have dropped by 57%. And in the last year, fatal stabbings are down by 23%. Tonight proves that the interventions coming from a diverse group of organisations and individuals are working better than anyone could have hoped for. It was a great night, you know, fantastic night. And that's what it's about. It's about young people enjoying themselves. You know, you don't need to be, need to be running about with a a knife in your hand or a brick or a bottle to enjoy yourself is showing young people an alternative to violence. 